benches, the guards and so on. What you see here is also not the wall from 61. This is a wall mostly from the mid-1970s to late 70s. There are several generations of wall over the years. The first one looked nothing like this. It was simply a slab of concrete on its edge with cinder blocks on top and barbed wire, and that was it. They replaced that with a second generation, even by 1963. What you're looking at here is generation four. It's got rebar running through it, it's got a concrete foundation, and that's the one that's still standing in 1989. The building behind it was originally the old uh, Nazi Air Force headquarters, opened up in 1936. This is the largest surviving Nazi government building in Berlin. Now they were desperate to have this monster, with its 2,000 separate rooms, open by the time the Olympic Games took place in Berlin in the summer of that year, because they wanted to show it off. The Nazis were quite careful to hide the more, uh, you know, abhorrent aspects of their dictatorship, so anti-Semitic propaganda just disappears for about three weeks. But one thing they wanted to show off was something that sent a message of strength, defiance and militarism. This is what this building's all about. Now, the Treaty of Versailles, back in 1919, something the Nazis always promised to overturn, specified that the German military be reduced. The army could only be 100,000 men. The navy could be a tiny amount. And technically, they're not meant to have any air force whatsoever. So if you're not meant to have an air force, what are you doing with the building of that side? This is them ripping up the Treaty of Versailles in the most dramatic way possible. This is them saying, not only do we have an air force again, but we're intending to make it so big, we'll need this to look after it. And amazingly, it survives the war pretty much intact. A lot of work has to be done to fix it up, but by 1949, the East German government are also using that building. They call it the House of Ministries, and it remains a government building all the way through to 1990. In 1965, four years after the wall was built, an East German citizen who had to go into the building on business once a month decided to use the proximity of this building to try and escape into the West. He went in one day with his wife and his little boy, little Gunther, nine years old, went into a bathroom, put an out-of-order sign on the door. The family went in, sat and waited until the building was shut down for the night. Then they emerged from the hiding place, got on the roof, got to the corner closest to the wall. Heights holds out full, attaches a rope to a hammer, throws it over the death strip, over the wall, into West Berlin. Now back then, the ground was completely flat here, completely level. His brother-in-law, his brother, his friends are waiting here with a truck and a long, thin steel cable. The cable's attached to the truck and the rope, and the cable and the rope are pulled back over the wall onto the roof. He attaches it to a flagpole that stood on the corner, flying the East German national flag, and then using a torch, he signals to the boys in the west to reverse until the cable's pulled tight. Little Gunther steps up, bawling his eyes out, absolutely terrified, rain battering down around him, his father puts him in a harness made of old seat belts, puts him on a pulley, and gives him a wee push. Little Gunter Holtz Apple is pushed from the East German government building over the wall into the arms of his uncle in West Berlin. Using a homemade zip line or death slide, the whole family, one by one, make it across mm. the Berlin Wall. 139 people that we know of, for sure, died trying to cross in Berlin in the 28 year period. At least 2,000 people make it. They make it because they're desperate, they make it because they're reckless in some cases, or they make it because they're creative, and that's the most creative escapable. Mm. The East German Stasi discovered 71 escape tunnels in Berlin in 28 years. Um, people make hot air balloons, like aircraft. They do what they can to get across. Mm. Now, the reason we still have the wall here, rather confusingly, is because of something from the Nazi people. As we go closer, You'll see down the steps here, you can see parts of it from here, the kind of red bricks below the wall. <coughs> this is the basement or cellar of an old building that used to stand here. It was an old hotel called the Prince Albrecht. Now in 1934, the secret state police, or the Geheime Staatspolizei, the Gestapo, moved into the building, turned it into their headquarters. Had you been arrested by the Gestapo in Berlin, you stood a good chance of being brought down here, brought down to the basement or cellar for questioning, or obviously much worse. Now, the building was bombed out during the war, the, the Western Allies knock it down, and then that's it, until the 80s. A new climate of honesty in the 80s allowed excavations to take place, and when they excavated the ground, they found the basement and cellar quite intact. Since 1987, they've been using this as a backdrop to an exhibition called The Topography of Terror. It focuses on the Nazi period, it changes from year to year. Uh, eight years ago, they supplemented it with that grey metal box across here, which is open all year round, seven days a week. Uh, outdoor and indoor, I'd say the topography of terror makes up probably the best museum about the Nazi period anywhere 
in the country today. Uh, if you have even a passing interest in this period, this is what I'd recommend more than anything else. 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week, completely free of charge. And it was these guys responsible for this museum, the curators, who in 1990, as the wall was being taken down and sold off slab by slab, it was them who suggested leaving it here. Because they said future generations should be able to come to one spot in Berlin and see the remains of two different dictatorships side by side. Sorry? Just the other side of the wall, there's a road. Yeah, the street is now called Peter Kirchnerstrasse. It used to be called Prince Albrechtstrasse. That's the death strip. Yeah, here it's a bit confusing because in some cases they knock down apartment buildings or even a couple of churches and commercial properties to make way for the death strip. And they could have or maybe should have knocked down parts of this building, but they were already using it as a government building by that. So what they did was about 25 metres up uh, past the corner of the building, the wall went all the way across the road and up to the building itself. It didn't go through the building, but a part of it came out the other side as well. So this this bit here, the part that holds half where his family escaped from, was technically in the death strip itself. This is why there's a lot of speculation about how the family actually made, managed to make it across. Um, one idea is that maybe the defences were a little bit less uh, severe here because they assumed that no one would be you know, crazy enough to try something like this. But that building, parts of it at least, about 5% of it was in the death strip itself. Anything else? Right, we're going to walk the full length of this monitor just now. Uh, Wilhelmstrasse was where almost all the major Nazi government buildings used to be. Uh, Gestapo, Air Force, Propaganda Ministry and Adolf Hitler's Reich Chancellery, all in one street. 